to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. Forever, God is with us. God is with us forever, forever, forever. 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 Amazing, your love is never ending. 
bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family, your children, and their children, the children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family, your children, and their children, the children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He's with you. He's with you. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He's with you. He's with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He's for you. He's for you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming. And you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 Beside you, all around you, and within you, he's with you, he's with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 he is for you. Lord, we come before you this morning and Lord, we confess through the course of this week we've been distracted, we've been tempted, we've been confused, we've been distracted. Lord, we've allowed the enemy to have his way in some cases. Lord, we've We've given in to some of the things we shouldn't give in to. We've struggled. 
to stand firm in You. We've struggled to be in Your Word, to read, to pray, to seek Your face. Lord, forgive us this morning. Lord, have mercy on us this morning. Lord, we are an undeserving people, but You, You are a gracious God. You are a merciful God. Lord, I pray that this morning our hearts and minds would be fixed and focused on You. Lord, give us strength. Give us victory. Help us to hear and listen and tune in to You this morning. God, I pray that Your will would be done in and through this place, this service, every aspect of it, Lord. What You want to accomplish, let it be accomplished today. Lord, I pray that You would draw us close to You today. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Lord, let your will be done. Let your Holy Spirit be in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with me this morning. Lord, I don't think I'm the only one feeling distracted this morning. And so I want to take a moment, Lord, just to come before you before we get into your word and just pray, Lord, that you would take captive our hearts, our minds, our thoughts. Lord, that we would be receptive and open and hear from you today. Lord, that we would honor you, Father God, and be obedient to you. I, I pray against the enemy and all those distractions that he pushes against us and, and tries to uh, use to, to pull us away from you. And I, I come against those right now in the name of Jesus. Pray, Lord, you would help us to be focused this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We are just two days away from celebrating our nation's 247th birthday. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Can you imagine all the candles on that cake? Who gets to make the wish and blow those out? Good luck doing that in one breath. <laughs> 247 years. I think a majority of us know or have heard of a gentleman by the name of Francis Scott Key. We know that he is the lyrical author of our nation's national anthem. It, it's interesting to me to know that the the music or the original composition uh, for, for the national anthem was actually written by a British individual. Put that together for a minute. A British individual wrote the American national anthem. Are you connecting that there? Anyhow, he's the lyrical author. You know the song, Oh Say, Can You Say? I'm not going to sing it, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What many of us may not know is that Key was a Christian. He was a believer. He was born in 1779 in Maryland and grew up in a Christian home. As a child, he read the Bible, ready for this? By the hour. So not for two or three or five minutes, but for hours he read Scripture. After graduating from college, Key struggled. He was torn between entering ministry and becoming a lawyer. He chose to become a lawyer. As a young attorney, he was criticized severely for arguing cases of slaves in court. In other words, he was for freedom of the slaves, and he was criticized for that. He became a successful attorney 
in Washington, D.C., where his brother-in-law, Roger B. Taney, was the Chief Justice of the United States at the time. Francis Scott Key was a devout Christian. Twice every day, he led his family in Bible study and prayer. He was an active member of his church in Washington. And in 1824, he helped to found the American Sunday School Union, which was instrumental uh, in founding Sunday schools all across the nation. And he served as its vice president for 18 years. All of his life, he tithed on his income. In fact, on his deathbed, he instructed his wife about tithing his remaining monies. He wrote letters to his wife and his children to be read after his death in 1843. He urged his children to be faithful to Christ. And he wrote this, Remember that you do not possess yourselves. Christ has bought you. And His precious blood was your price. Pretty incredible for the man who authored our Star-Spangled Banner, our national anthem. Perhaps another thing you didn't know is that there are a lot more verses to that Star-Spangled Banner. We are very used to what we sing and the short little version that it is But there are actually three more verses to that song that he put together. Now, we're not going to sing them this morning. I certainly am not going to try to sing them. We're not going to go through all of them. But I do want to share with you the the lyrics of the fourth verse, because this is pretty interesting to me. Thus it be ever when freedom shall stand between their loved home and this war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven's rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. When conquer we must, when our case it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And this star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. What shaped Francis Scott Key's life was his commitment to Christ. What influenced the things he did like fighting for freedom was his love of God. What stood at the center of his family was Scripture and his desire to teach his kids and his wife to trust God as he did. Now I want you to think back for a minute. You may or may not know this. What inspired Francis Scott Key to write the words of the Star-Spangled Banner? See, it was during the War of 1812, the British had overcome the American forces and captured Washington, D.C. In fact, they had burned the White House. And our government had to flee from Washington. As the British fleets savaged Chesapeake Bay, Baltimore was about to fall. And had the enemy at that time taken control of that bay, the United States would have been crippled, seriously crippled. On September 15th, 1814, Francis Scott Key, then a young attorney, was actually negotiating with the British for the release of a prisoner. He was on a ship. He was aboard an enemy ship waiting for a reply while the British were bombarding Fort McHenry all night long. Against the blackness of night sky, Key watched bombs bursting in air. And he prayed for America. He said, please, God, 
It has been Thy grace that has made our country strong. Preserve Thy handiwork and help us to stand as free men. As the sun came up the next morning, Key looked out through the fog and the battle smoke, and he was thrilled to see the American flag still waving at Fort McHenry. He took out a letter that was in his pocket, and he wrote the star-spangled banner on the back of the envelope from that letter. And then in 1931, Congress made it our national anthem. In the midst of war, I wonder if this jumped out at you at all. In the midst of war, all that fighting, all that battle going on, uh, uh, trying to negotiate for a prisoner in the midst of war. What is it that Key needed to do? He prayed. He saw what was happening. He realized the urgency. He saw what the potential outcome could be. And he prayed, asking God to preserve our country. How often do we pray for America? How often do we pray with that kind of energy and enthusiasm that I can only imagine Key was praying? How often do we stand in the gap and say, God, preserve our country? I know there's a, a, a great deal of debate about this uh, with some people, but I believe that our nation was founded on the Word of God. I believe our nation was founded on Christian principles. Born again believers came together to develop a new nation. And I believe the Word of God, Scripture was a key part of that. Christian principles flowed freely in that discussion 247 years ago. And there was a solid foundation that was set for the land of the free and the home of the brave. A solid foundation to be built upon. What has happened to that foundation? Where has that structure gone? I don't necessarily consider myself a, a history enthusiast. However, I love to learn about our nation's presidents in particular. I love to know the things they did and how they did them and what they said and, and what they're uh, uh, credited for. I, I just I love that whole... Uh, concept of our presidency and, and those that have served in that uh, position. I, I love to hear about them. Some of them have given some incredibly inspirational speeches over the years. I'm sure even now you can think of a couple in your head. I mean, the Gettysburg Address being one. Uh, some, some of their uh, inaugural speeches are incredible. They've given amazing speeches over the years. And some of those have occurred on or around Independence Day. My favorite president, at least to date, my favorite president was Ronald Reagan. He was, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest presidents this nation has ever seen. I know Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and there's many others to choose from. I get it. But what Reagan did and accomplished, and I, he's just one of my favorite. He is one of those individuals that was very gifted at speaking. And he gave some very incredible speeches over the course of his presidency. There were two that were given on back to back nights that I'm going to draw a little bit from today. The first one was given on July 3rd, 1986. He was on Governor's Island in New York. See, over the previous two years, the Statue of Liberty had been covered with scaffolding. 
and it was being completely restored, rebuilt. But on that night, President Reagan spoke at a couple of key moments as he rededicated that statue and relit Lady Liberty's torch. In his address that night, he said these words, The God who gave us life, Thomas Jefferson once proclaimed, gave us liberty at the same time. But like all of God's precious gifts, liberty must never be taken for granted. Tonight we thank God for the many blessings He has bestowed on our land. We affirm our faithfulness to His rule and to our own ideas, and we pledge to keep alive the dream that brought our forefathers and mothers to this brave new land. We are the keepers of the flame of liberty. We hold it high tonight for the world to see a beacon of hope, a light unto the nations. And so with joy and celebration and with a prayer that this lamp shall never be extinguished, I ask that you all join me in this symbolic act of faith, this lighting of Miss Liberty's torch. The very next night, obviously July 4th, 1986, on board the USS John F. Kennedy, President Reagan had another speech that he gave, and among that came these words. My fellow Americans, it falls to us to keep faith with them and all the great Americans of our past. Believe me, if there's one impression I carry with me after the privilege of holding for five and a half years the office held by Adams and Jefferson and Lincoln, it is this, that the things that unite us, America's past of which we are so proud, our hopes and aspirations for the future of the world and this much-loved country, these things far outweigh the little that divides us. And so tonight, we reaffirm that Jew and Gentile, we are one nation under God. That black and white, we are one nation indivisible. That Republican and Democrat, we are all Americans. Tonight, with heart in hand, through whatever trial or travail, we pledge ourselves to each other and to the cause of human freedom, the cause that gives light to this land and hope to this world. Now that was an exciting piece of the speech for me to read. But in that same speech, he also shared this. All through our history, our presidents and leaders have spoken of national unity and warned that the real obstacle to moving forward the boundaries of freedom, the only permanent danger to the hope that is America, comes from within. I share this with you today because I'm wondering about some of those things. Where are some of those same principles at today? Where are the urges to stand for unity and hope in this free nation? Where are the Christian ethics that we once saw displayed by this nation's leaders and dignitaries? Where is that automatic reflex to pray like Francis Scott Key did in the midst of raging war? Where is the desire for unity in our nation today? Has that solid foundation set in places set in place so many years ago, really deteriorated that badly? 
has it? Are President Reagan's words coming true? Are we falling apart from within? Do we have any desire or longing to see this land restored? To see the foundations on which it was established shored up and rebuilt? i got to tell you, the condition of our country concerns me. Concerns me. There is a passage in Scripture we're going to peek at today, and it's in Second Chronicles if anybody wants to open there and get ready. This particular passage of Scripture, some will argue only applied to the nation of Israel. And it was a very specific promise. And I don't know that I agree with that. I don't think we can go into all the specifics today, but I believe this portion of Scripture can be applicable to us today as much it was, as it was applicable when it was written. If nothing else, let's just agree to do our best to learn from it today. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple. For sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land and send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Some of us know this Scripture full well, but how often do we stop and tear it apart and think about it and look at it and dig into it? Of course, the key verses there are verses 13 and 14. God, as He does so often in those two verses, He lays out an if then statement. If you're familiar with math or use Excel a lot, you will know what I'm talking about with an if-then statement. It's a conditional statement. It's a term that is used to convey a process. If these parameters are, are met, then this can take place. A very oversimplified example of this would be if you have enough money while you're at the store, you can then buy yourself a candy bar. If you have the money, then you can buy a candy bar. Or grow. It's an if-then statement. God uses them a lot in Scripture. One thing has to be in place before any other desired results are achieved. In this case, God tells Solomon when difficulties come on the nation. And that's the first thing I want you to notice. It's not by chance if something bad happens or, or if, if things go awry and, and difficulty comes. God says when these things happen. When these difficulties, when these bad things arise, that's the first thing we need to remember. That's not the statement, though. He says, when those things arise, then he enters into that if-then statement. He says, when those hard times come, if, if you turn to me during those times, then I, God will hear you, forgive you, and heal your land. Notice who has to do the initiation there. 
It wasn't God. God says, when those bad things happen, you have a choice. You can try to figure them out on your own. You can walk away. You can do anything you want to do. But if you choose to turn to me, humble yourself, pray, seek my will, come after me. If you choose to do that, then I'll hear you. Then I'll turn my attention to what you're saying. I'm not going to listen to your mum, your murmuring, or your, your, your whining, or your complaining, or all that junk. When you choose to turn to me, then I'll listen. And I'll heal your land. And I'll forgive your sins. Folks, I believe this is the same message, this same if-then statement could be said to us today. We have been faced with all kinds of whens, but I don't think we've done very good with the ifs. So why should we expect the thens? Unless we're going to change, why should we expect anything else to change? God has blessed this nation abundantly. Hear me loud and clear. The poorest of poor of the poor in this nation are still thousands times better than some in many other nations. As crazy as that might seem, that is a very true statement. If you've never experienced some of the other nations in this world and the things that they deal with, you don't have a clue how good we have it in this country no matter how little we might have or how poor we might be, we are still way better. And i got to tell you, with the things I see today, with the things I hear today, with all the stuff that I witness and, 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 and have bombarding me today, I'm going to tell you in my own humble opinion that President Reagan's words are coming true. This nation is falling apart from within. Lord willing, we'll never see another 9-11 or Pearl Harbor because we've got the defenses to take care of that. But unfortunately, we are going to continue sabotaging ourselves from within unless something changes. We no longer have this desire to turn to God. Not at any time. We just simply don't have that desire. We used to turn to God in times of trouble, and now we don't even do that. We just don't seem to ever want to turn to God and ask Him to help, ask Him to forgive. Instead, we want to turn to the world. We want to turn to each other. We want to turn to societal trends and fleeting desires. That's what we want to turn to. We, again, need to be one nation under God. If our nation is going to remain a great nation, externally as well as internally, then we need to heed the same words that God spoke so many years ago to Solomon. If we trust Him, if we obey Him, if we humble ourselves, there's a lot of ifs there. If we are willing to do those things, then He will hear and heal our land. If we want to see changes in this nation, then the church has got to fall back on its knees. The church has to have that same attitude that Francis Scott Key had. He was in the midst of a physical war. We are constantly in the midst of a spiritual war. 
our first inclination has to be to drop to our knees and pray. We need to stand in the gap for our government, for our leaders, for our court systems, for our nation as a whole. We need to seek God's forgiveness and His mercy. Prayer has got to be one of the highest priorities in our life in general. But certainly, prayer for our nation at this time, at this day and age, is unbelievably important. Because this nation simply will not heal. This nation will never ever see any of that foundational repair until we return to that scriptural instruction that we have been given. It's just that simple. It's not going to change until the church changes. The instructions I believe that this nation was founded on and once held firm are wavering, are crumbling. We're about to celebrate Independence Day. We're about to get excited about our freedom and all that goes along with that. But if we want this Independence Day to really mean something, if we want it to be any different than it's been before, if we want it to be a a real excitement for us, then we need to take the time to remember what was said about a nation years ago and how that Scripture applies to us today. It is only if we obey those instructions that that healing process can begin and America can return to God. Our land, as absolutely great as it is, is in desperate, desperate, desperate need of healing. Everything that we experience around us today is indicating decay, not healing. Decay. People are trying to put a spin on a lot of things to make them sound really good. But what they're actually doing is pushing forward that destruction and that rot because they're not done from the heart of love and the foundation that God has given us. We need to heal from within. And that healing cannot occur if we are not on our knees praying and seeking the promises that God has given us. And if you think this is overwhelming, if you think this is too much, if you think this is more than you can bear, I want to remind you of something we learned just a couple of weeks ago. One individual influencing one church had an effect on the entire nation. If you were here, you'll remember I talked about the history of Father's Day. One individual pressed a ministerial association in the state of Washington and the churches grabbed a hold of that. And that passion reached all the way to Washington, D.C., and eventually became a national holiday known as Father's Day. It started with one person. If you think this nation returning to its knees and beginning to get back to its biblical Christian roots is too big of a job for you, you're wrong. You're wrong. One person can influence one church and it can have an influence on one nation under God. I encourage you today, as you make your plans, as you do your celebrating, as you watch your fireworks and have your picnics, and do all the fun things you're going to do the next couple of days, I encourage you to remember 
that if we are obedient to God's Word, then He will hear and heal our land. And it can start right after service today, ladies, as you join Kathy and Jody for ladies' prayer right up here in the beginning, at the front of this church. Today, right after service, is the time to pray. If we will humble ourselves, then God will heal our land. Lord, thank You so much for every promise You've ever recorded in Scripture for us to hear from and learn. Lord, we focus on this particular one today. Lord, we are not a nation that is pleasing You at this point. Just, I don't, can't put it any simpler than that. We are not the nation we were designed to be. That we were established 247 years ago as. God, I pray that You would change our hearts. I pray that we would realize that this statement is as true today as it was when it was written years ago. God, help us to humble ourselves to understand and obey your word so that in doing all of that then our land can be healed god we pray for that today i know i know there are hundreds thousands thousands of people in our nation today that think they're doing the right thing god would you help them to see just how wrong they are I don't say that from an arrogant or proud standpoint, God. I say it because I'm concerned about the people of our country. God, would you help them to see the error of their ways? Would you help all of us to return to your word, to live in the love that you have told us to live in? God, would you help us to heal from within and once again become that strong dominant nation that we were set out to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. We are a moment You are forever Lord of the ages God before time we are a vapor you are eternal love everlasting reigning on high holy holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, highest praises, honor, and glory be unto
lead us and guide us, Lord God, to our knees, that we might be the nation to pray, Lord God, just as you have told us to do in your word. Empower us, Lord Jesus, that this nation would be once again founded, rooted, and grounded in the word of God. And we seek you in Jesus' name.